This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. For this episode, we're speaking to Joey Lawrence, otherwise known as Joey L. Joey is a portrait photographer, so it's more like art photography as opposed to photojournalism. But he's spent the last three years going back and forth to Rojava in northern Syria where the Kurds are fighting and carving out a land for themselves. He's been reporting on the various battles and the culture that's being built there. He says himself he's not a journalist and the first time he actually went to war was in northern Syria in 2015. And he's got some quite strong opinions on how to capture culture in amongst the war zone. What you do is kind of like art photography, right? Would you explain it as art photography? And then you went into, you know, making docs in Rajab. Like, how did that happen? That's right. Yeah. So I describe, I always describe my work as portrait photography and not uh, journalism or photojournalism, because when we think of photojournalism, it's more like, uh, you know, raw and observational and capturing moments and, and things like that. But portrait photography is uh, a little bit different where like the subject is aware that there's a person there, right. you sympathize with them, you openly uh, work with them to create something where uh, the camera is present and could be with eye contact, but a portrait basically means that the person sitting in front of it is aware of the photographer and there's some stylistic components to it that would not be acceptable in the photojournalism world. So they're two different traits, like both use cameras, but it's two different lines so, of thinking. So rather than capturing a scene, it's like saying, let's make a scene. Let's make this cool. Like, let's do it like this to portray whatever. Well, I don't really mean like setting up a scene so much. Sure, you could like pause time and have someone sit there and they're aware of you, but I don't mean fabricating stuff. No, no, no. It's just more like when you look at it, uh, there's an awareness that it's uh, something stylistically different than just a snapshot or something like that. But I mean, if I wanted to set up everything, then you could do like a movie or something like that. That would be different photography right, yeah. as well. Like they're still real and even somewhat raw portraiture. Maybe you could argue that somehow more raw, more realistic when people present themselves to you. But that's a whole different world that I don't want to get into, meaning photojournalism. Whereas like fine art photography is uh, you're, you're telling a story in a different way. So how did you go from doing that to, you know, making very raw and, you know, dangerous documentaries in Rojava? Because, you know, I first saw your films, I was like, wow, man, I'd never, how have I never heard of this guy? And then it was like, oh, okay, he does something different. You know, how did that happen? So, yeah, I've done a, I've done a lot of projects on uh, endangered languages and cultures in Ethiopia, Indonesia, um, people who basically found themselves inside of a state that they didn't agree with their uh, ethnic minority or their way of life is threatened let's say and i've done projects like that for maybe 11 12 years and uh, i always wanted to do something on kurds and i always thought they were interesting like in canada there's pe people know who kurds are there's mm. a Kur uh, uh, kurdish community in toronto but uh it was kind of in the back of my mind like if i want to do something in mesopotamia or whatever then uh, I followed the Syrian civil war very closely because it was one of the first wars that was openly broadcast on social media. It was like reading, you know, old soldiers' journals, but in real time. Yeah, it was As crazy. Now it's normal, yeah. but at that time it was really something shocking. So I followed that and then I learned uh, about what was happening in Syria with Kurdish struggle and suddenly it made sense to fit into my existing work to do something on Kurds. Now, of course, I'd followed like Arab Spring, like everybody else since 2011, but I only started to find out about YPG and these kind of groups in late 2012, early 2013, when they started revealing themselves on the internet using their own videos. So, I mean, you remember that time well, like you could follow jihadists who would later join isis like you get a really it's crazy rare it's window that like yeah. wasn't on the news and that was really fascinating for me so even before i was interested as a photographer i was following it that way and then i guess my entry point like my excuse if you will to be there was to do a portrait project that i wanted to turn into a book um and i didn't have to wait for like a publication to send me 
no sensible publications would send me who has no experience in war to like do <laughs> do this project. So yeah, so what was that like? So I mean, it's self funded, when... self everything project. When did you first did. go, sorry, to Rojava? Uh March two thousand fifteen was the first trip. Twenty fifteen, so that was the first time. That was like a heavy period, right? Like just after Kobani. Yeah. Um what was that like going there considering, you know, like you said you've never been to war before? I mean, I was scared shitless of everything. I was paranoid, but I was with really good people. And over the course of several trips, I learned to trust Kurds. Like, um, you know, they, as you know very well, they really take care of you. And um, I, I mean, dude, when, when I look back, like, I thought I knew a lot because I had followed it and the conflict and stuff. But when I look back now, I was like, I knew shit. You, you know, like, I was a fucking idiot. Like, guns would fire and they'd be loud. And I wouldn't know that the, you know, they're coming from the side that you're on. Like, that's a good thing. <laughs> Where it's like, it's bad if you hear like a snap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, like, yeah, you know, stuff yeah. like that. I didn't know. And yeah. I was just, I was paranoid. Everyone, I didn't trust anyone. I was, ah. But I sort of like, you, you know, I, I work with Jan and EPEC. These are trustworthy people. And I sort of told myself, like, you know, if I start they, off... They were with, like um, Kurdish fixers, right? These are Kurdish... Yeah. yeah, sorry. These are these are uh, very trusted Kurdish fixers. And I thought if I start off with them, I have a good sense. I can take it step by step, day by day. And I went out, and I went there saying, like, oh, like, I don't really want to go to front lines. I just want to do this, like, portrait project. And by the end of it, you know, I wanted to go where the fighters mm -hmm. were, right? So... I mean, my first trip was really short. It was only two weeks. But the second time I went back was, like, for 40 days. And then wow. I went back again. That's after, a long after, time. Yeah, and I went again after that. And it's just, like, I really fell in love with the place. And for a photographer, it's obviously interesting. But, like, I, I really believe this, that if you're doing a project like this, a passion project, even if your camera breaks or whatever, you should still want to be there and be interested in mm -hmm. it. And so mm -hmm. these are the two... I guess levels that interest me about that conflict is one Kurds as a literally a, an endangered language group that fought back that like rose up is something very even ideologically interesting for me but as a photographer also what's happening there is visually stunning also yeah, incredible, yeah. so mixing those two worlds is what I try to do with the series to tell that story of basically um, these people who are like under threat of genocide from radicals, especially the Izidi groups. That's who I spent the most time with, Yabisha. And basically uh, fighting back and how that happened. So that's what what I did. So you were first one there in 2015. Uh, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that because that was like a very interesting time. Oh, in sorry. Yeah, right, right. No, no, right. it's fine. Just, just go with it, man. So basically, uh, yeah, you're right. They had received the YPG in Syria, the Kurdish uh, armed group had received air support in Kobani, but it was very minimal at that time. So when I went there, the main fight uh, was just finishing in Tel Hamas. Okay, that that was like just finishing when I was there. There was clashes in the countryside ev everywhere. Mm. I mean, the front line was just snaking farmland. Like a jigsaw smashed to bits. Yeah, and the main city fight was in Tel Tamer. And I was so inexperienced, I felt really unsafe in Tel Tamer because even though they had American air support, they were losing neighborhoods because what? ISIS was using bar uh, uh, hell cannons, like barrels. And like I made made Yeah, right? and it, it's like the first time I learned how to hear things in a war, like that's what I was talking about with the shooting, it's like you'd hear these fucking things launch and they'd sound like seesaws in in the air, like metal going like wow, 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 because they're so harshly made, the yeah. fins or whatever. And Oh, okay, everyone likes to say, like, oh, the only reason why YPG is successful, they had American air support. Dude, they had barely anything at that time. I mean, they, they weren't being supplied ammunition. Sometimes a house would blow up that they got called in, but they're really on their own, especially outside of Kobani after the camera stopped rolling until a little bit later. How that, do you feel the air about support that? kicked in? Like, sorry to cut you in, but I yeah. think that's really important what you said. Like, how do you feel about that? Because, you know, as someone who's also followed the Kurdish conflicts very closely, I meet a lot of these kind of pseudo-analyst types, as I call them, um, kind of giving it this, that, and the third about American air support. You were there. You saw it. You know, how, does, how, do you, how do you take that when people are giving it that? The only reason why YPG, or let's say that movement in general, is so successful is because they did not listen to any of those analysts or any of like people in D.C. They took their own, let's say, third path. They didn't go with the rebels. They didn't go with the, the Assad. They wanted to protect their own areas, let's say, 
as Kurds, but also as a unified struggle for groups in the region, minorities, let's say. So I respect that. But to answer your question is like, the heart of their movement is their own. And when you go there, what the Americans are doing has certainly escalated and it does turn the tables and it does help, but it truly is their own thing. And like, I think America as an army, let's say, U.S. Army, has more to learn from the organizational structure of SDF than vice versa. Wow. Because Americans have been trying for decades to do this, like, buy with and through shit, coin shit, where they try to make armed groups have power and uh, local governance, and they realize how terrorists are actually born or whatever. And they get a group like YPG that was already doing it before they did like just with grassroots movements because they had so much training like from their work in like Turkey as PKK trying to organize the tribal militias and blah 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 is uh you really see that this comes from their own decades of experience and I think that the U.S. Army learned lessons in Iraq and Afghanistan that those guys they see SDF and they're like fuck yeah they're their biggest supporters The other wings of the American government, like CIA, their programs are total failures because they don't learn anything. And if you talk to these guys, they're fucking retarded. So that's how I feel about it. What always fascinated me was, you know, growing up uh, as kind of a teenager or whatever, I was quite young when the Afghanistan war and the Iraq invasion was happening. And you'd hear this like, oh, democracy in a box type thing, right? We all, we all know that was a complete fucking disaster, right? Yeah. I see when, they, when the CIA are trying to do all this thing, it's like you guys are trying to create an armed force in a box, you know, and it, it, of course it ends up in disaster at the same time. But why, maybe you can go in a little bit more detail about what is it specifically that makes the SDF so well organized uh, from your perspective? I mean, that's, I, I think it's difficult to answer, but the first thing it comes from is uh, a will to fight. This is some bullshit that I never believed in before. I thought it was in movies or something. But when you meet someone who... Like, let's say they're Yazidi, yeah, and they had their family killed by ISIS, and they become, like, a really radical fighter. They have so much willpower to fight. I think that's number one. They, like, actually want to do it. They're real fighters. In some cases, if they don't fight back, they'll literally be slaughtered. So they have a will, let's say, a really strong will. Even one of their commanders told me, you know, I used to be a commander in Iraqi army, and we had all the equipment, all the weapons, and we couldn't do shit. I now command a group of 18-year-old girls, <laughs> and they're better fighters. So well, yeah. I think will is, is, is the main thing. But the organizational structure that came from uh, PKK cadros going back and returning to Rojava and becoming YPG members, let's say, those guys have decades of just experience. So the second I think is experience. Because let's say ideologically PKK has nothing to do with FSA. But some of the gangster shit and some of the like, like, like really violent kind of shit that FSA does, you can see is very similar, not similar, I, I don't want to compare the two, but a lot of the more reckless stuff is what you do when you're not organized, when you don't have experience. We could say that's like the uh, mid 80s, early 90s of, of PKK, it looks like Syrian rebel stuff. Yeah, because like we have yeah. to say they did a lot of bad shit in them times, you know, they execute some of their own, they well, did some crazy attacks. Well, they acted like FSA basically. So if you have that as a foundation and you have a ideology that embraces you to learn from your mistakes and be super critical and all these kind of factors weave into it, I think you got a really successful, uh, not only armed group, but also political strategy. So all this stuff about like, oh my God, they're PKK. Like, honestly, people should be happy that PKK went to organize people inside Syria, or I think that place would be completely under the control of ISIS, there'd be way more genocides. Even FSA would be more fucked because they cut off uh, the border of of Turkey and the radicals were also fighting the rebels, let's say. Mm. So, like, I see this as a changing idea since the, since the uh, mid-80s and early 90s. And as you saw yourself, we were, we were talking about your time in, in uh, Kurdistan inside Turkey. Mm. Those youth and YDGH are fucking radical and they're crazy. But when they get organized by someone, let's say a little bit more of a rational actor like HPG, you can at least deal with them yeah. and find something. And if you don't have that, you get a generation of tech basically. Definitely. So, so like, I just see it 
like when they flew the apple flag in Raqqa, it, to me it was like a moderate symbol of like we want to organize people, we're going to respect minorities. I I saw it as an ideological flag, not like oh we're PKK. Like when do they do the secret ceremony at at midnight and swear allegiance to the PKK? Yeah. Like people have it really really backwards. It's just it's it 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 really it really drives me crazy but i think that's really where their success comes from is just learning from their mistakes and experience right like getting good you know like you said about with the the ydgh you know the essentially the urban youth wing of the pkk at the time you know okay they were radical they were fucking nuts and they were reckless and they wanted to fight and it was a complete catastrophe to be honest you know everything got leveled however you got to remember, these kids held out, and I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, but they held out in places like Diyabakir and Sur, or in Jizra, or in Nusaybin, or any of them areas, held out for like hundreds of days against NATO's yeah. second largest army. You know, I was there, I saw what they had. They had, you know, ANFO bombs, you know, light arms, a few RPGs, you know, mines. But they fucking had a willpower. And they knew what it was like to be oppressed by the Turkish state. So, what was the alternative? Yeah. And it and again, it's like when you talk like that, it's like, oh, you're apologizing, baby killer, blah blah. It's like, dude, this is this is what war looks like. There's there's not any side that doesn't do any messed up stuff. Exactly right. Well, I always say it's like war's a bad place, and the guys that act really fucking bad are probably gonna do quite well. You just yeah. have to hope that they've got some kind of good intentions inside. Yeah. You but know? but let me stop one sec. I'm not trying to equate Turkish army to to uh, like Kurdish youth. Turkish army is ten times worse. They're not fucking equal. When your state you have responsibility. This is my critique of the regime. I'm not totally anti-Assad, this crazy, oh, Assad is un sleeping under my bed at night, I have to check for it. But when, my critique is when you're the government, you have to take on more responsibility and be the rational actor than these armed groups. And when you start to act like them or worse than them, then your story crumbles. Yeah. So that's my issue, yeah. You become a rogue state. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, and you. Were I saying, started to get real comfortable with you. I started dropping f bombs. Tell you how I really felt. No, good. That's how you should be. That's how you should. But um, you, you were talking about like, um, you know, uh, was it uh, born from urgency, right? Yes, yeah. I, I watched that, and I, you know, visually it was incredible, and I thought it was really just great. The whole way you kind of tracked the journey, especially when they get into Sinjar and that scene where they detonate, you know, detonate the the bomb. I was just like, it's fucking amazing. It was just really, I don't know. You really managed to capture. You know, I've not been to Rajava, I must say, like, I tried so many times when it went to shit. But I, I think you really captured the kind of camaraderie and... Uh, how, how did you go about that, you know, as, 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 you know, essentially an artist or photographer, whatever? How did you capture that? Was it conscious or what? Yeah, I think um, I just didn't try to make a piece that would be accepted by the journalism community. I think the journalism community would probably scoff at it. And be like, oh, look, at you did this, you did this, you inserted this here, and stylistically did this, or like you're like sitting with them here when you shouldn't do that. Oh. I just sort of I approached it the same way I approach my photography, which is a uh, you know if you're doing portrait photography, you have to be there at a really human level, and uh, you 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 know war and conflict is not owned by journalists. When this happens, they're not the only people that can make a study of it. They're not people who can inform you of culture, actually. This is a job of artists. And basically, imagine trying to read a Reuters article about one of your songs from YDGH. And you post the lyrics, and those lyrics inform you of all the ideals that they have channeled into that group. They talk about we're strong, like this historical figure. Mm, the like lyrics are, are this, they're Akawa, yeah. And basically like would you ever read a reuters article about that song no but it's but it, that's not the place for it it's not right or wrong it's just it's a different medium so a photographer is like studying those kind of things like the song like what compelled a young fighter to write those lyrics knowing that he would have a social pressure from his friends to channel into the song what they believe in right so he had to write those songs and sing them and it had to be accepted amongst the group as their direction. That really says something about what they want to believe, right? Yeah. To me, that kind of stuff is more interesting than the day-to-day, -day, like, oh, 
this group pledge allegiance to this group or definitely it uh, tells you a lot more we got another merger that. another rebel merger yeah <laughs> hts is joining a raw shot rebel merger oh geez yeah like, really interesting anthropology and culture i was gonna say do yeah. you see it as an anthropological kind of pursuit with a human face yeah definitely and do you not think the two could you know like as you know i, I am a journalist i'm not an activist i'm not i I'm, I'm love journalism but i'm very fucking sick yeah. of the industry and its snottiness and it's up its own uh, ass kind of problem do you not think the two could somehow merge you know like i would obviously i'd work with you happily but yeah, you, you know merge. you're not a they journalist you yeah. say you're not a journalist do you not think the two can merge and make it work well they should merge because people who go there doing other projects need to be informed like imagine if uh someone recklessly went there and didn't study these things and didn't know about things and they just wanted to take like cool war pictures or something that's totally wrong it needs to be a careful balance of both it should never be tourism yeah it should well definitely not but the thing is is even even journalists should maybe learn from the other side and they believe in this sort of uh this this spell that they've cast for themselves that comes from just i think an, an establishment industry that's slowly dying and people don't really know what to do and because of that i think the quality of media is suffering but there's still people doing good work that i think merges the two worlds it's like it's got to be you know eye-catching it's got to like people have compassion fatigue they have to pay attention it's got to be visually stimulating it's got to do stuff but it has to have bones too so these two worlds should should learn from each other would you consider your work you know born from urgency the other films your book would you consider that a work of journalism in some ways as well I would personally. It just uh, yeah, I, I definitely would. Yeah. I think it is. I think in in like in like the Tom Wolfe sort of definition of journalism. How do you mean? Well, in a sort of uh, in a different writing style or a more narrative form. For 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 sure, what it's not is a, like let's say like raw purist journalism. But to to fine art photographers that you know have museums and stuff like that, it's too real. But to like photojournalism is too out there. So it's somewhere, so it's in the middle. I I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> which which makes it difficult and and weird a weird niche but that's that's what i like it's, that's what weird I, niches I, I really, are the best way yeah i really want to on this podcast yeah yeah well thanks <laughs> thanks you know i you know i i, I want to have stuff with integrity but i'm actually interested in this stuff like i follow it like a hawk it's like mm. it's like a sick obsession right no no you and me have spoken for hours online about this shit you know yeah what I mean? and you, you know you, you should know i i should know about it outside of like cool pictures to take or whatever that should inform you and i hope when people look through the book or read it let's say like that i somehow captured something that wasn't just surface level because photography is a very trivial uh surface level medium right so there's there's a layer of depth that i think you can get even in photography just by knowing about something and studying it carefully so that's it's a, it's a fine line but that's what i'm trying to do with all my projects i don't i'm not a war photographer i don't mm. go to like different war zones like this is the only war that you I just happened to go to this one because it's about Kurds, yeah. And you spent, um, you know, in your films, you spent a lot of time with the YPJ, so the female wing yeah. of the, you know, the Kurdish uh, fighters out there. Um, and I know, you know, you're we were speaking about this earlier. You're interested in genealogy, uh, which is their, how do you say their their kind of feminist ideology out there in Rojava. Um, you know, I wonder what your take on it is. You know, as like a white male, <laughs> like you believe in it, you know, and you're you find it interesting. Um, just w what do you think about it? How did you receive that? Because you were there amongst it in action, you know. I think when you when you um, first of all they they radically influenced my thought. Let's say because when you're out there and you witness uh, female fighters that are basically fighting and dying and are real they're not like a photo op like some you know like peshmerga units or stuff like that like ypg ypj are literally equals um, yeah they're fighting and it, right? and it really does trickle like their idea is to trickle down to all aspects of society and during wartime the soldier is the most prominent and when you have female fighters it means that the whole society can somehow be e e equal well if you go there and you witness that and you don't think that i think you really don't have a heart <laughs> so like i i told you a story earlier but i remember going there uh seeing those women fight right and it's not like a funny thing it's not like a flirtatious thing like look at the you know chick in a uniform yeah it's kinda, i hate that look at these hot white pj chicks shut the fuck up yeah these these are these these women really have my full respect and they really really helped me i think um sort of evolved my train of thought just by seeing them and i remember 
going back and stopping in an airport, seeing like a hip hop music video and like women being degraded and like after coming, spending time with YPJ and just feeling like fucking weird about it. So like, I, I guess I just respect them a lot. And has that stayed with you even now you think it's changing yeah, yeah, irreversibly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. I could use a little bit of work around the edges. <laughs> yeah, couldn't we all? I mean, <laughs> but, but yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, maybe you can share with us like some stories because, you know, I was watching your film and you can tell that, you know, you have their trust, you have, you know, they have your trust. I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about those kind of interactions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you go somewhere, this is probably against the ethics of like purist journalism or what, whatever, but I can explain what the project is, yeah. right? I come here, I, I literally show them my work on an iPad. This is stuff I did in Indonesia with a shamanic indigenous hunter-gatherer tribe. Did you know that the government of Indonesia has repressed these people and tried to ban their culture? They're very curious. Mm. Like, even as as you know, like, Havals are very curious people. They If you ask them a question, they'll try to ask one back. Yeah, they listen. Yeah, so I say this project is kind of like that, but it's about Kurds. And I've chosen, like, Apoji movement as a focus because it's very ideologically interesting i've read this book this book i've read abdullah ojalan and you could sort of just try at, at least in the beginning to describe what you're doing and try to separate yourself from maybe others that come and visit and take pictures and leave like i really want to understand this i really want to get it right and that's i guess a form of collaboration and when people feel that you're involved that much I mean, if you've fucking smuggled yourself into Syria in those in those times and did that and you're there, they already kind of respect you. But if you show equal respect to them and what you want to do, you go through the permissions, you take it slow, don't take pictures in people's faces, don't like it, like take it, you know, just how we're talking now is, is I think the way you would approach anyone in any country. It shouldn't be different in Syria or Iraq or whatever. So... That's my process is just to go. I spend a lot of time. I'm super slow. You know, it's a tea culture. <laughs> you have to explain called, everything called, a million yeah. times. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's part of the thing, man. No, definitely. So, it so it's yeah. like yeah. you, you kind of get into this in this momentum. And um, if you visit back the second time, people remember you. You get more access. Like uh, like Ridor Khalil, the um, spokesman of YPG, like shared my video on his Facebook page. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they knew what I was up to. So it was easier the second time. It was easier the third yeah, time. Yeah, they know you're not going to fuck them over, essentially, right? Yeah, and when you do that, they'll trust you more and they'll give you access to real to real stuff. Whereas if you didn't, maybe not. So it's not like you're going to fuck them over or not. It's just they'll they'll take a chance with you and they'll show you real stuff. And they know that you can use your uh, observational skills to just present it how it should be. So it's not changing anything. It's not like, oh, don't shoot this, don't film this. It's more just like we're gonna allow you to enter our world more, mm, mm. and that and 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 that happens. Like I, the last trip, I was photographing like ISIS prisoners. Um, I was seeing uh, fighting areas they wouldn't let anyone go to. Obviously, staying with them in bases, not being told to go back to camp, it's just stuff like that. But that also comes down to my local fixers. That's just not me. Yeah, Jen's great. Because right? I can explain in English all you want. If you had a bad local fixer that's not equally trustworthy who talking for you, you're not going to get shit. Yeah. And Jan is Jan is just a, an incredible guy, really well spoken. He's like me, takes his time. And even when things seem not to be happening, there's a Kurdish way to doing things, mm. right? There's just suddenly the ways part and you get everything yeah. that, that you want to see. But if I were to just honestly, sometimes if I were to be able to speak directly to people with my sort of like Western fast paced, like New You'd York style, up, right? I would probably fuck myself. Yeah. 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 Or I would be perceived as rude. Right. So it's like, yeah, there's, there's a filter. There's a way to do things. Um, and I want to ask you about, you were with uh, some of the Arab uh, militias who are part of the SDF, work alongside the YPG. Were you with the Mambij Military Council? So basically, uh, there are a whole cluster of former FSA fighters and groups who used to call themselves as FSA. In some cases, even fought alongside ISIS and mm. al-Nusra and Aleppo, yeah. some of those guys. They discovered Before ISIS went nuclear. Uh, they discovered <laughs> what was actually going on, and yeah. they basically fled to Kurdish areas. Let's say, to make a long story short, but before they were Manbij Military Council, 
I mean, Manbij Military Council is something different now, but the nucleus was a cluster of a whole bunch of different groups, namely Shams of Shamal, uh, Northern Sun Brigade. And those guys are like Abu Layla, Sher- uh, Sherwan, those guys. And ba- basically they had um, fought alongside YPG in, in Kobani as Shams of Shamal. Also another group called Euphrates Jarablus Brigades, uh, Jay Suar. Army of Revolutionaries, those guys cluster together, and the guys that were from, like, they cluster together as SDF, but then the guys from Manbij made Manbij Military Council, like Abu Leila is from Manbij. So, they're, like, they believe in a lot of the, the, the things that the Kurdish movement represents, like self-determination, they don't want the regime, they don't want to be part of the rebels, they just want self-governments, they want a functional society that's not fucked up. It's kind so, of like a libertarian attitude. Or it's libertarian, yeah. In yeah. the midst of all that war. I would say so. Not like Alex Jones libertarian, but like no, proper like, libertarian. Like, like. like the, yeah, like like the European uh, definition of yeah. it. Yeah, certainly. Um, so yeah, those guys, they get along with Kurds fine because they can self-govern their own areas and that's good for Kurds. It's better to have them next door than Al-Nusra Front or Turkey. And, and at that time, sometimes there's tension, but they get along fine, especially... When they're up against ISIS, so you were in a really rough area with them, though, like a very volatile area. What was that like? Well, those <laughs> those guys, let's say they fight very differently. And like yeah. when when you go to YPG base, you know, there's like no mess, all the garbage is away. They will like have an order and a structure. But dude, when you go to an FSA base, it is a fucking mess. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute, if yeah. this is how the base looks like, how are you fighting? Yeah. And they really try, man. Like. I think of the whole war, Abu Layla had the hardest job of anyone because he wasn't given a group of like young fighters to mold. He wasn't given a group of like Candelian PKK to command. He was given all these ragtags from all over, over Syria to well, try, young men, right? yeah, that have fought the regime for five years, whatever, to try to turn them into a real army. This is this is a nightmare, mm. and you could see it. Like he he was a really nice guy. Did you meet Abu Layla? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe you can explain who Abu Layla is for anyone that doesn't know. So Ab- Ab- Abu Layla was uh, in a cluster of different FSA groups. He's a very famous commander. He's dead now, but he was the leader of Shams of Shamal, and and he never fought against YPG. He joined them uh, to fight alongside them as an FSA leader. Let's say. But basically, he had the job of trying to get all these ragtag fighters to be a functional army. And you could see that it was stressful work and difficult. But he was a nice guy, but very strict. And as one should be if they're a commander of a bunch of guys with guns. Uh, But anyway, um, those guys, (laughs) that that area, so it it was all around like Sarin, around the Euphrates River at that time, outside Ain Issa. It was before Raqqa was taken. And like, dude, you would like just go to the countryside and you just wouldn't know what is under whose control, where is like flags. Uh, you go to bases, you just see like hamlets in front of you that are under the control of ISIS vaguely. But it was very, yeah, it, it doesn't have the same feeling as being with YPG who are very structured, let's mm. say. But still, respectable people, good, good people, and over time you can start to become feeling safe with 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 them but you might not want to like stay there at night in some front lines in some areas are a little dicey you might not wake up or you might want to like take ypg with you yeah 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 <laughs> and um yeah. what's what is uh you know obviously afrin has kind of fallen essentially now yeah. to these i don't want to say turkish back rebels they're sent you know they're getting paid you know turkish back fighters let's be diplomatic um but what 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 do you think now what is in the future for rajava now in your opinion, you know, somebody has been there, you've been all around. I think that um, what happened in Afrin is a tragedy. The world should be ashamed of itself. Everybody that pretends to support Kurds, mm. what I mean is every nation state. Um, I, I mean, it's everybody who wants to talk about ethnic cleansing in other areas of Syria that's real but doesn't talk about Afrin. Uh, mass displacement, forced displacement, all these things. But in some ways, to be honest, I hate to admit this, like on record, but I'm very, ho- I'm very positive, very hopeful about, let's say, east of the east of the Euphrates River, because 
I think that Americans have been wanting to try to infiltrate Syria and get in there since before the Arab Spring. And they saw the Arab Spring as an opportunity to do so, to support rebels, to overthrow the government. But they kind of have a huge bargaining chip to have influence in the region. Mm. But at the same time, there's sort of this movement in America to not want to be tied up into Middle Eastern affairs. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. So it is a tricky... It is a tricky thing. I think I'm maybe more positive than you are about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a but bit I, confused. But, yeah, but I do think that their best chance would be to use the resources that they have captured under their control, uh, use their strength to make some deal with whatever future Syrian government there is for a federal zone and not to go all out crazy like KRG, which is not their plan anyway. And I think that Americans should assist them in that negotiated effort. But if they get tied up in this thing with America of trying to be against Iran, trying to be this, trying to be that, which is what they are not, I think they're going to get burnt. Mm. And I think they know that very well. They know it more than any other Kurdish movement. So in some ways, they're very clever, but that can only get them so far. But it happens to happen in a unique time of history where America wants influence in that region in a let's say in a country that they've been trying to influence for a very long time so i think there's hope in that way but i still think that they should stick to their gut instinct that has led them this far and they can't become an american tool and the moment they do they're going to lose everything yeah i I agree in that sense like i don't think they should become an american tool and it's for example when they put the apo flag up in raqqa and you know a lot of these kind of psychopathic kind of vampire analysts like oh my god see they're wrong it's like no they're just not playing the game you all fucking want them to play and why should they you know they just sacrificed how many of their people to fight in raqqa which was never kurdish land anyway but i'm just worried that america will fuck them so hard that they end up kind of disappearing but i don't know (laughs) i'm glad you're hopeful i'm worried too but hopeful yeah Yeah. and the flag thing i respected them a lot more after that i thought that was fucking badass westerners always want people to act their own way even when they pretend they're so fucking liberal they want house curds if you know what i'm saying yeah that's what they want exactly and i I had one problem with the flag though it should have been bigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got one more question for you, Joey. Right. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to like a young up and coming photographer? I think that uh, the, land, the, the landscape of photography is changing rapidly, more so than anyone could ever calculate. Teachers in university, for the most part, not all, but are mostly failed photographers that even if they were successful, come from another era where things made sense. The visual landscape, there's more need for photographers than ever before, but people's eyeballs are in different places. They're looking at their phones instead of billboards, for example. So there's a need for visuals and a need for storytellers more than ever before, but don't look in the places that have a legacy. When we think back and we know a printed magazine, a magazine cover is important. If all magazines collapse, then people don't care who's on their covers. So I would say to look closely where people's eyeballs are and pursue that and only pursue niche, uh, passion, passionate topics that they can sustain themselves with if the economic aspect is not working out, that they can be generally interested to fucking fight and push really hard to make good work. Excellent. And where can people find your work? Uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram, same handle, at joeyl.com, J-O-E-Y-L. D-O-T. D-O-T. Sorry, C-O-M. dude, I've, I've, I've been up <laughs> since fucking 4 thir- J-O-E-Y-L-D-O-T-C-O-M. Also on Instagram, same shit, www.joeyl.com is my website. And the Kurdistan documentary that you mentioned is bornfromurgency.com. Fuck, my brain's fried. <laughs> no, man. Excellent. Thanks, man. That was Joey Lawrence, also known as Joey L, talking about his time in Rojava with the Kurds, with the YPG, and speaking about how he went from being a portrait photographer and how he documented the war going on out there in Rojava and the struggle of the Kurds in the Syrian war. You can find more of Joey's work, as he said, at joeyl.com. Uh, do go and watch his docs they're absolutely amazing you can find his latest Kurdistan one at bornfromurgency.com 
For more on Popular Front updates, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I do them, at Jake underscore Hanrahan, J-A-K-E underscore H-A-N-R-A-H-A-N. Or follow more episode updates on the site, which is jakehanrahan.com slash Popular Front. We're also on Patreon because I kind of want this podcast to be something else. I want it to be better. I want to do documentaries with it as well. It's patreon.com slash Popular Front. Music in this episode, the intro as usual was by an artist called Home and the outro which is actually music made up of uh, sounds from Petscop. Now if you know what Petscop is, you're a nerd like I am. Um, And that music was by Stuart Henderson and you can find his music at soundcloud.com slash stewwen.